as an individual ages into late adulthood, psychological and cognitive changes can sometimes occur. A general decline in memory is common due to the decrease in speed of encoding, storage, and retrieval of information. This can cause problems with short-term memory retention and with the ability to learn new information. Psychosocially, as people enter the final stages of life, they have what Eric Erickson described as a crisis over integrity versus despair. In other words, they review the events of their lives and try to come to terms with the mark that they have made on the world. People who believe they have had a positive impact on the world through their contributions live the end of life with a sense of integrity. Uh, those who feel they have not measured up to certain standards, either their own or others' standards, develop a sense of despair. It's important to point out that there has been a demographic shift. 200 years ago, there were 20 times more children under the age of 15 than people over age 64. Now there are only three times as many. And today, almost 9% of the world's population is 65 or older. This is indicative of an ongoing trend where the elderly population has been rising steadily in recent decades. According to uh, United Nations data, uh, the United States has 15% of the population 65 or older. In Canada, 16%. In Italy, it is 22%. And in Japan, 26%. A demographic pyramid is a pair of histograms, back-to-back, -back, one for each sex, that displays the distribution of a population in all age groups and in both sexes. The x-axis is used to plot population numbers, and the y-axis lists all age groups. The shape of a demographic pyramid can be used to interpret a population. For example, a pyramid with a very wide base and a narrow top section suggests a population with both high fertility and death rates. Whereas a pyramid with a wider top half and a narrower base would suggest an aging population with low fertility rates. India's population still looks like a pyramid, but note that within the past few years, the demographic shift has begun even here. Uh, there are fewer children under five than in uh, the three higher age groups. Note that the world is in the midst of a uh, notable period of demographic transition. The uh, increasing numbers of older and elderly people has been referred to as the rectangularization of the demographic pyramid, as you can see occurring in this graph from the United Nations. Demographic pyramids can also be used to speculate a future of a population. An aging population that is not reproducing would eventually run into issues, such as having enough offspring to care for the elderly. There are three traditional reasons for the traditional pyramidal shape, and none of them is currently true. More children were born than the replacement rate of one per adult, so each new generation had more people than the previous one. Many babies died, which made the bottom bar much wider than later ones. And serious illness was usually fatal, reducing the size of each older group. Most studies of the elderly thus far have classified elderly adults into just one group. With the increase in the elderly population, some studies now classify elderly adults into three categories. The youngest old are the largest group of older adults. They're healthy, active, financially secure, and independent. The old old suffer losses in body, mind, or social support, but they care for themselves. The oldest old are dependent and relatively few. There are several theories of aging. First is the wear and tear theory. It's a view of aging as a process by which the body wears out because of the passage of time and exposure to environmental stressors. The body simply suffers from overuse, weather, harmful food, pollution, and radiation. This theory has been discounted by evidence from calorie restriction. This is the practice of limiting dietary energy intake while consuming sufficient quantities of vitamins, minerals, and other important nutrients for the purpose of improving health and slowing down the aging process.
There's the genetic theory where the species has a maximum lifespan or a genetic clock. There's also the cellular aging theory, which uh, focuses on ways molecules and cells are affected by aging. The Hayflick limit is the number of times a human cell is capable of dividing into two new cells. The limit for most human cells is approximately 50 divisions, an indication that the lifespan is limited by our genetic program. Teleomeres it refers to the area of the tips of each chromosome that is reduced a tiny amount as time passes. By the end of life, the teleomeres are very short. Researchers at Stanford University discovered a modified RNA that encodes a teleomere extending protein to a cultured human cells. Now, this was one study, but researchers believe the study is a first step toward development of teleomere extension to improve cell therapies and to possibly treat disorders of aging in humans, thus turning back the clock. Teleomeres have been compared with the plastic tips on shoelaces because they keep chromosome ends from fraying and sticking together, which would destroy or scramble an organism's genetic information. The textbook delves a little deeper into genetic theory. It emphasizes that every species has a maximum lifespan and genes determine the maximum. Some genes cause unusually fast or slow aging. Others program a long, healthy life. And two alleles of the APOE gene are found in 12% of men in their 70s. But death is more common in the 88% without it. Moving on to the next section of the uh, lecture, there's a form of prejudice called ageism. Ageism involves stereotyping and discriminating against individuals or groups on the basis of their age. The term was coined in 1969 by Robert Neal Butler to describe discrimination against seniors, and it operates similarly to the way that sexism and racism operate. Butler defined ageism as a combination of prejudicial attitudes toward older people and the aging process, discriminatory practices against older people, and institutional practices and policies that perpetuate stereotypes about elderly people. Ageism is a form of prejudice in which people are categorized and judged solely on the basis of their chronological age. And it considers people as part of a category and not as individuals. Unfortunately, ageism becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy with three harmful consequences. If younger adults treat older people as if they are frail and confused, that treatment itself makes the elderly become more dependent. If professionals believe that the norms for young adults should apply to everyone, they may try to make older people behave as younger adults do. If they fail, they give up. If older adults themselves focus on what they have lost instead of what they have gained, they lose the joy of old age. It's time to take a look at the facts. Illness and disability are facts of life, not simply the result of aging. Recognition of the reality of primary and secondary aging is needed so that health can be protected. Primary aging is the gradual and presently inevitable process of bodily deterioration that takes place throughout life. Secondary aging processes result from disease and poor health practices. We hope that uh, advancing medical technology and medical knowledge uh, will move the known and understood aspects of primary aging into the secondary aging category as rapidly as possible. Research on age-related attitudes in the United States consistently finds that negative attitudes exceed positive attitudes toward older people. According to the World Health Organization, the most socially acceptable prejudice in the world is ageism. But it comes at a cost. The stereotypes, discrimination, and devaluing of the elderly seen in ageism can have significant effects on the elderly, affecting their self-esteem, emotional well-being, and behavior. Old age is a risk factor for depression caused by such prejudice. When people are prejudiced against the elderly and then become old themselves, their anti-elderly prejudice turns inward, causing depression. 
research has found that people who hold more ageist attitudes or negative age-related stereotypes are more likely to face higher rates of depression as they get older. Old age depression results in the over 65 population having one of the highest rates of suicide. Nothing has been demonstrated to slow or reverse the primary aging process in humans. Instead, the factors that are known to affect longevity do so by their influence on disease development, which is part of secondary aging. Preventative strategies against secondary aging are aimed at maintaining health and functional capacity and rectangularizing the demographic pyramid. Physical exercise and adequate sleep are the foundation for wellness. Older adults spend more time in bed, take longer to fall asleep, and wake frequently. And elders feel less tired than young adults when on their own schedule. Exercise. Older people exercise less than younger adults do. Um, most exercise classes, team sports, and equipment are designed for the young. Movement of any kind is better than sitting still, and regular exercise can compress morbidity. Muscles stiffen and atrophy, making exercise more difficult, and accommodation to disability may be needed. Elder speak is a condescending way of speaking to older adults that resembles baby talk, with simple and short sentences, exaggerated emphasis, repetition, and a slower rate and higher pitch than normal speech. Some examples are, uh, oh honey bun, you want to go to bed, don't you? Or is our tummy hungry for some foodie? Although it's not intended, it's irritating, degrading, and patronizing. It contributes to depersonalization, using inappropriate terms of endearment instead of um, names that uh, can cause you to, to think in a vague way about the person with whom you're speaking and make it easier to forget that he or she is an individual with a unique personality and specific preferences. One of the best ways for family caregivers and professional caregivers to refrain from using elder speak is to focus on an older adult's strengths rather than their weaknesses. Also keep in mind that no matter how much an aging loved one may decline physically or mentally, they are still an adult. A good rule of thumb is to interact with all elders in the way you would want to be treated if the tables were turned. Selective optimization with compensation is a strategy for improving health and well-being in older adults and a model for successful aging. It's recommended that seniors select and optimize their best abilities and most intact functions while compensating for declines and losses. For example, an elderly person with fading eyesight who loves to sing could focus more time and attention on singing, perhaps by joining a new choir while cutting back on time spent reading. Overall, this model suggests that seniors take an active approach in their aging process and set goals that are attainable and meaningful. An example of a selective optimization with compensation in late adulthood is driving. With age, reading road signs takes longer. Turning the head can become harder. Reaction time slows and night vision worsens. To compensate, many drive slowly and reduce driving in the dark. Older adults voluntarily choose to reduce their driving and will change their lifestyle. For example, older adults frequently report personal preference as the main reason to avoid traffic and rush hour. Self-report and objective measures of vision impairment are strongly associated with restricting driving at night, driving at night while raining, driving in the rain or bad weather, and driving in unfamiliar places. Speed is crucial for many aspects of cognition, for example, memory, sensation, perception, and strategy, and maybe the G, the intellectual ability that is the foundation of all other aspects of intelligence. Senescence reduces production of neurotransmitters. Neural fluid and volume of gray matter decrease. Myelination thins and cerebral blood circulates more slowly. White matter lesions are thought to result from tiny impairments in blood flow. And this increases the time it takes for a thought to be processed. Information processing in late adulthood changes in terms of input 
or sensing. Some information never reaches sensory memory in older people because the senses never detect the stimuli and the brain automatically fills in missed sights and sounds. Most older people believe they see and hear whatever is important, but vital information may be distorted or lost without the person realizing it. Elderly people's underlying problem with sensory input may be the brain, senses, or both. When hearing fades, many older people avoid social interaction. Not so for Don Shula, the former head coach of the uh, Miami Dolphins, who led his team to two Super Bowl victories. He kept his players fighting, often surging ahead from behind. And here he proudly displays his hearing aid. Memory is another part of information processing that may be affected in late adulthood. Also, there may be a stereotype threat uh, due to ageism, as we earlier discussed. If older people suspect their memories are fading, the anxiety itself impairs memory. And uh, two things can happen. There may be source amnesia, forgetting the origin of a fact, idea, or conversation. And uh, perspective memory uh, may be affected in that uh, one may have difficulty remembering to do something in the future. Output is another area of information processing in late adulthood that may be affected. In daily life, output is usually verbal and the output on cognitive tests uh, may not accurately reflect the ability in old age. Uh, something called ecological validity needs to be considered by researchers. It's the idea that cognition should be measured in natural settings and schedules. Uh, cognition should be measured in settings that are as realistic as, as possible. Uh, abilities measured should be those that are needed in uh, real life. In the next section, we discuss neurocognitive disorders. The rate of neurocognitive disorders increases with every decade after age 60. However, ageism and ageist terms distort and exaggerate that fact. There are many neurocognitive disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease, vascular disease, and other disorders. Let's take a closer look at these. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by gradual deterioration of memory and personality. It's marked by the formation of plaques of beta amyloid protein and tangles of tau protein in the brain. It is partly genetic. If it develops in middle age, the affected person has inherited a specific gene or genes. For these people, the disease progresses quickly, reaching the last phase within three to five years. Most cases begin much later, uh, at age 75 or so. Uh, many genes have some impact, including the APOE4 gene, uh, allele 4 of the APOE gene. Uh, people who uh, inherit one copy of APOE4, as about one-fifth of all U.S. residents do, uh, have about a 50-50 chance of developing Alzheimer's disease. Those who inherit two copies almost always develop this disorder if they live long enough. There's a table in the text which uh, explains the stages of Alzheimer's disease, and I'll just mention them here. One, forgetfulness, especially for recent events or new information. Two, generalized confusion. Three, dangerous memory loss. Four, impaired communication. And five, unresponsiveness. This computer graphic shows a vertical slice through a brain ravaged by Alzheimer's disease on the left, compared with a similar slice of a normal brain on the right. The diseased brain has shrunken because neurons have degenerated. The red indicates plaques and tangles. Neurocognitive disorders may affect only certain areas of the brain. These are, the, for example, the uh, frontotemporal neurocognitive disorders, and the most common is Pick's disease. Pick's disease is a kind of dementia similar to Alzheimer's, but far less common. It affects parts of the brain that control emotions, behavior, personality, and language. When you have Pick's disease, the tau proteins don't work the way they should. You may also have more of them in your brain than other people. These abnormal clumps of tau proteins are called pick bodies. Pick bodies derail your transport system. 
the track is no longer straight and nutrients in the brain can't get to where they need to go. This causes brain damage that can't be reversed. Differentiating between types of dementia can be difficult. Alzheimer's disease, the most common cause of dementia, can be uh, distinguished from uh, frontotemporal lobe dementia, like Pick's disease, because memory loss is one of the first notable symptoms of Alzheimer's. Frontal lobe dementia is not usually associated with memory loss in its early stages. Speech problems appear first, such as hesitant speech, difficulty articulating, stuttering, and ungrammatical speech. The symptoms of Pick's disease fall into two broad categories, difficulties with language and behavioral changes. Unlike other dementias, such as Alzheimer's disease, memory is not affected until the disease has become quite advanced. The frontal lobe of the brain, which is located uh, behind the forehead, helps control an individual's impulses and behavior. As Pick's disease shrinks and otherwise damages this part of the brain, the person gradually develops a lack of social tact. Uh, they can become completely uninhibited in their behavior as they lose their sense of what is and what is not appropriate. Vascular disease can affect neurocognitive functioning, and here we are referring to stroke, a temporary obstruction or bleeding of a brain blood vessel. Strokes happen mainly in uh, one of two ways. Either there uh, is a blood clot or plaque that blocks an artery in the brain, or a blood vessel in the brain breaks, causing a bleed in the brain. This stops blood from getting through, stopping the delivery of oxygen and nutrients. Parkinson disease is another uh, disorder. It does not always lead to dementia. It does start with rigidity or tremor of the muscles as neurons that produce dopamine uh, degenerate. Younger adults with Parkinson disease may avoid dementia for years. Older people develop dementia sooner. Another disorder is Lewy body disease. It's named after the round deposits of protein called Lewy bodies in the neuron. They are numerous and dispersed throughout the brain. Motor movements and cognition are impacted, and the main symptom is a loss of inhibition. Severe brain damage cannot be reversed, although the rate of decline and some of the symptoms can be treated. And this can occur through education, uh, regular exercise, and good health practices, such as uh, taking medication as prescribed and avoiding any pathogens. As it has been pointed out, severe brain damage cannot be reversed. However, some conditions can mimic neurocognitive disorders, uh, depression, is the most common reversible condition that is uh, mistaken for uh, NCD. Malnutrition can cause symptoms that may seem like brain disease. And polypharmacy needs to be considered. This is a situation in which elderly people are prescribed several medications. The various side effects and interactions of those medications can result in dementia symptoms. In this uh, final section of the lecture, we consider whether we become older and wiser. Both Eric Erickson and Abraham Maslow were particularly interested in the perspectives of the elderly, interviewing older people in depth to understand their views. Now, Erickson believed that healthy people achieve integrity. The final stage in his model in which older people gain interest in the arts, in children, and in human experience as a whole. Maslow believed people reached self-actualization. He maintained that older adults are more likely than younger adults to reach the highest stage of development in his model. He thought that uh, some youth may already be self-actualizers and some elders are still at the uh, lower stages of his hierarchy of needs. However, he believed with each passing decade, people are more likely to move up his hierarchy. Self-actualization is the final stage in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's characterized by aesthetic, creative, philosophical, and spiritual understanding. Aesthetic sense and creativity do not diminish late in life. Generally, extraordinarily creative people feel that their ability, their goals, or the quality of their work is not much impaired by age. 
A life review is an important aspect of this developmental period, according to Eric Erickson. A life review is a natural process in which a person brings segments of his or her life together to make a whole picture that is understood and has meaning for that person. Erickson viewed a life review or reminiscence as vital to the task of stage eight, the stage associated with old age. Uh, a life review can help older individuals acquire ego integrity and avoid despair. A life review, according to Erickson, can help create an acceptance of one's one and only life cycle with few or no regrets. Depending on the culture, aging can be seen as an undesirable phenomenon or as an accumulation of wisdom and respect. Many of the oldest men in Mali, like this imam, are revered. Unfortunately, Mali has experienced violent civil wars and two national coups in recent years, perhaps because 75% of the male population is under 30 and less than 2% is over age 70. While countries like the United States focus more on independent care, other cultures place greater emphasis on respect and family care for the elderly. In contrast to the United States, many countries view elderly citizens, especially men, in very high regard. Traditional values demand honor and respect for older people who are considered to be wiser from experience. In China, several studies have noted the deference and respect to one's parents and ancestors in all things.